celebrating the life of advocate George Bezos on the eve of his 90th birthday. <laughs> stretches 
along that entire wall. Um, I want to thank our exhibition and education team who worked extremely hard on this exhibition, as they always do. I'm always very grateful to all of them. If I start by naming one or two, I'm bound to miss some, and I don't want to get back into trouble. So all of you... You can raise your hands and thank you very much to all of you. So very briefly before, I, I'm not the speaker, you may think I, this guy is the speaker. I'm the, however, I, there's a couple of uh, more words before I pass on to our main speakers tonight. Tonight we're also launching um, George Beeswell's memoir about his lifetime friendship with Nelson Mandela entitled 65 Years of Friendship. These two country boys each, uh, found each other while pursuing a career in law at the Wits University in the late 1940s. Nelson Mandela suffered racism at the university in legal circles and in broader society. Bezos tried to mitigate the effect of this oppression. From the mid-1950s, Bezos and others assisted Mandela and Tumbo in their practice, particularly during the treason trial, but it was during the Rivonia trial that their friendship was tested. And after much argument, Mandela agreed to insert, if needs be, into his speech from the dock to quantify qualify, rather, the statement that he was prepared to die for a democratic society. Over the next 27 years, George Bezos visited Nelson Mandela on Robben Island, and later in Polesmoor and Victoria Fustair prisons. He was a source of news from the outside world, and Mandela's connection to his family, who he entrusted to Bezos' care. George also defended Winnie Mandela 20 times over 35 years. After Mandela's release, he and, uh, uh, he and um, George spent many hours discussing the shape of a new South Africa. George Bezos turned down Mandela's office of a position in government or a judicial appointment in favor of continuing to work as an advocate. It was a proud moment for Bezos when he accompanied Nelson Mandela on a visit to Greece in 2002. Here they renewed, here they renewed their discussions of the classics and their contemporary relevance. On one occasion, towards the end of his life, during one of Bezos's many visits, Mandela called for his boots. When asked what he needed them for, he said, George is here. He will take me to Tkunu. But with those short words, I would now like to introduce you to our chairman, Dr. John Carney, who again has been a friend and colleague of mine over many, many years, and we've walked a long journey, and in, in over the last 17 years, can you believe it, we have worked together as he is my chairman at the Apartheid Museum. Dr. Carney. Well, I, I um, will not use the script because uh, I'm not paid this evening. <laughs> the other day, I came to the meeting, and I was 70 years old, and I was so proud that I'm 70 years old. And at the meeting, I leaned over to George and I said, George, I'm 70 years old today. And he looked at me, and that wry smile like Shylock in the Merchant of Venice, knowing more than you know at that particular time, and not disclosing that he knows more. He says, how old do you think I am? <laughs> it's so not good, you know, to be in the company of such great elders, where you always being 74 and you're still the youngest in the room. <laughs> the apartheid museum, was the birth child of a few men and women when we discussed how will we remember the past. Shall we remember the past with its bad past or shall we create a space where people can come and look at the past and walk out feeling much better knowing that past and much ready and prepared to face the future. So the concept of the Apartheid Museum is a walk in in an experiential journey and that will give you a sense of how many people actually
contributed to what we call today our democracy. This is the space where young children come in hundreds of thousands every year to walk around and sometimes the, teacher, the uh, guides take them to other areas so that they don't see the horror and the horror of apartheid. But still, it is a place of healing. George joined us at a very critical time when we were arguing and trying to negotiate with our sponsors then to try and find a way to give us a right of continuity. Although we are funded and really grateful to Toho San and before that Akani Egolim, before that even the Croc brothers and all of them, there was always the problem of when you change the minister uh, overnight because you had a mind thinking of I'm reshuffling the senior management. <laughs> you may find yourself not in favor of the new one. So we were discussing this. And I kept saying, can we have a document, an agreement document, even if, even if it's 99 years? And George said to me, that's what England thought about Hong Kong. <laughs> they never thought 99 years would come. So I'm thinking, what should we put stronger, George? And he leans over and he says, in that whimpering way, that's almost like, does he want to cry or does he want to laugh at me? He says to me, in perpetuity, John, in perpetuity. And this is what we go for at the Apartheid Museum. The other time, we met at the, um, the documents that George and Joel Joffe and the old man Kentridge had put together. They were going to be handed over to uh, Madiba, those documents from the case of the Rivonia. And George was standing next to me, and George uh, said uh, to Madiba, Madiba, this is John Gunn. He says, oh, yeah, he's our boy. He's our, I know him. I know him. And I uh, said, oh, do you know these people? And Madiba says, oh, these are the bad lawyers who defended me and are sentenced to life. <laughs> <laughs> and Joel Jovi and George looked and smiled. It is really an incredible honor to live with giants like you, George to be able to tell my children I know him. We were together in the same space, in the same area, sharing the same vision for a better South Africa. I was saying to your daughter that looking at this picture, I said we need to take George to Libya and talk to the people trying to use these silly boats to try and cross the Mediterranean. They're going the wrong way. They should come this way of the Mediterranean and then they'll reach the continent. Because even that is a painful memory for all of us. Just to see how many people die every day, every day trying to leave their own countries to find a better life somewhere. I was telling Christopher a joke about Morgan Sangarai charged with prison in, 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 uh, in, in Zimbabwe. And I don't know how he got hold of George to defend him. <laughs> And George arrived in Harare, and the judge sitting in front of the prosecutor and the ZANU PF representatives takes his head off and says, It is an honor, sir, <laughs> to be in, in your same court with you. And I could imagine the prosecutor and the ZANU PF saying, Oh my God, we lost it. <laughs> and they did lose it. Every time when I'm writing a play and I want to understand about the past and the time I'm writing it, I come to George and I say, George, could you tell me about this position or legal interpretation? George starts from the Spartans <laughs> and the Athenians. I have to be very patient because he's going to come ultimately to the 21st century. <laughs> but at the end of that conversation, I go back to my blank pages and I feel much more at ease to write. I know 
we always be together. I promise that I will attend the 90th, and I want to promise the family and you that I'm the speaker at your 100th birthday. I did that to my grandmother, who, who at 98 kept asking my father, John And my father said, he's in London, he's coming back in three months' time. He says, oh no, I can't wait. <laughs> no, I can't wait. And he, she made a silent exit. Therefore, it's a great honor for us to have this space as the George Bezos Gallery. It is another feather on the cap of the people who work here, the board and our funders. It is again another feather on the cap of the people of this country and this beautiful country. This beautiful country. I was 51 years old when I voted. I walk around with 51 years nightmare of that past. And every time I wake up, I look on the television and I hear what's going on. I ask myself, is it back to the struggle again? I don't know how you feel, George. Sometimes I want to say, please don't sit on the telly on when George is at home. He can't see what we're doing to this beautiful country. But you must see, because when the time comes in your 101, you can tell the ancestors that I think they're on the right track now. And hope so. Soon, talk a snake. A great, great another gentleman around us here. Uti Khang Sineka, our Deputy Chief Justice. I watch television and I watch this opera, sad, macabre. And sometimes I'm thinking you're asking questions because they are legal, because Uti, you are the sitting judge. And sometimes I look at your eyes and I want to weep with you. How do we get to this point all the time? How come we've given our capacity to think, to feel, to care until this happens, until something happens? But that's not the day for that. This is a day to celebrate your life, your work, and your association with this great institution called South Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Big Jack. Thank you, Big Jay. I'm now going to call on the Ambassador of Greece, uh, Ambassador Kouvaritakis, if he'd kindly come and say a few words. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being present here in this event. Uh, just very briefly, I like just pronounce two, two, two big thanks. First to you, Uncle George, for what you have done in your life as a defensor of uh, civil rights, liberties, freedom, democracy, as a staunch defensor of uh, the fighters of anti-apartheid. As uh, the man who has laid a beautiful bridge between what Greece represents in culture, in uh, ideals, in philosophy, all this tradition, with uh, the, this beautiful uh, rainbow nation, and uh, we keep in uh, the road and uh, the path that uh, you opened. Uncle George, according to the religious tradition, your name means the one who combats the dragon. You have spearheaded and you have killed the dragon. And uh, I believe that. <coughs> This tradition, this combatant spirit will, uh, will live on with the next generations. Second big thank should go to all of you that you, you have organized this, this event. Because this event is not the well-deserved recognition, acknowledgement and honor to, uh, to the personality, to, to the life and the achievements of the life of uh, George Bezos. It is uh, the one that... Uh, uh, helps uh, living alive, keeping alive the legacy that uh, has been created by his efforts and by all those people 
who have surrounded him, who, who were along with him, and uh, that he had the honor to, 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 to defend uh, during uh, his, uh, this life. Many thanks for both, and uh, I wish and I hope that the legacy that has been created will be kept alive by the next generation so that this nation, and not only this nation, the whole world, because you, have been, you are a citizen of the world, of the, of the world as the president of the Greek Republic, uh, has, I am revealing, has, is sending a message for your 90th anniversary. Uh, I'm not going to read that <laughs> on this occasion, on another occasion, has, has said, so that all this legacy keeps, uh, stays, stays alive because we need this, uh, uh, to, to keep alive this tradition, this legacy, this spirit and the combatants for the future. The world is quite unstable. Uh, and uh, we need some, uh, some personalities, some enlightened personalities to, to open the way, to, 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 to shed the light, to guide us for something better, that we have the, 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 the expectancy for something better in the future. Thank you very much. Again. Thank you, Ambassador. I can't resist um, asking that um, the Honourable uh, Deputy um, President of uh, our Judiciary at a particular moment, Judge President, Dihang Musaneki, to come and have a, say a few words. He said he would, so please do. <laughs> <laughs> please do. <laughs> Deputy Judge President Musaneki, you've got to say a few words. I thought I said I warned, <laughs> and I, um, I'm just here to, to pay my respects. Baba George knows he had one love affair with Nelson Mandela, and one with me, which he never discloses. <laughs> um, and I've had the privilege of living very close to him. My mentor, my mentor in a million ways, Siabonga Baba. And, and that's all I, I really would like. And thank you for ask, allowing me to write the foreword. But thank you for allowing to do so many things together. You're one of our greatest leaders. And I'm here to pay my respects. Siabonga Baba. Right, the next, uh, next up um, is um, Dr. Enoch Duma. Is he here? Good evening. Uh, first of all, I must say how fortunate I am uh, tonight to have this pleasure of speaking on behalf of uh, the people who organized this wonderful uh, memorial. We are celebrating the life and <coughs> excuse me, the life and work of a great man. Maybe some of you are not quite aware how great George Bezos is. At least he is to me. Uh, if I were to begin telling the story of what he means to me, it will take a w the whole week. And I, I bet it won't be a lousy story. <laughs> I, when I was arrested, by the security police. I was placed in a very awkward position. Uh, some of the people I had been working with, uh, I still wanted to defend them because uh, of what they meant to me. 
And the talks and the consultation by George Bezos then who would come to uh, number four, the fort, and ask probing questions. Sometimes it was very difficult to speak freely about those people, especially the young person or we had 15 years old who had been told by the police, security police, that uh, uh, if he opens his heart and talks to them truthfully and honestly about the work he has done for the terror movement, the ANC, uh, it would shorten his time in prison. Uh, they would give him uh, all the things that he needs in prison. They will send him to school, and they will look after his family, and all the nonsense that one would hear from the police. He was my strength, my pillar of strength. He was everything blessed and good that ever happened to me. This man I adore with all my heart. I'm short of saying that he is, I wouldn't say that, but he is my God on earth. He took my case at a time when uh, it was very difficult for some people to, uh, to defend me. Uh, he, has, he assured me that everything is going to be all right. You don't have to worry. Everything is going to be all right. We're going to work very hard. And I remember one day, the editor of the Sunday Times <coughs> was my editor, Tasha Smeber, asked George Bezos, some searching questions about me, which I think he was not supposed to ask, but because of his enthusiasm in pleasing the, uh, the status quo, he asked those questions. Uh, he wa wondered about me and said, is Enoch Duma uh, in ignorance? about what is happening or what has happened or he, is he just fooling us? And he maintained that I was guilty even long before I was sentenced to, uh, as a free man, I was told that I was blameless. Uh, as I said, I cannot thank you enough. I cannot wish you a good life in your old age, like me. And I know that uh, there comes a time in our lives when we need to rest. I would say, in closing, that you should go home and in the knowledge that there are people who love you, and there are people who wish you well, who will always wish you well, and that it, is, it will always be a pleasure for us to hear your voice. Even if you have departed for a better world, we will still talk about you. For centuries, we will talk about you because of what you mean to this country. The work you have done is amazing. Giving your life to the struggle was no mean thing to do. You had to sit down and consider all the difficulties that you were about to meet along that way to freedom. And I want you to assure you that uh, today we are celebrating, or we are supposed to be celebrating uh, the freedom we earned 23 years ago. And I know 
that every loving, peace-loving person in South Africa will always celebrate your name whenever it is mentioned in the great books of this country. In closing, I would say, when you go home, be assured that you have people, millions of people, who will always be grateful for you because you, we are free today because of you and you are part of that freedom. I dread to think what would happen if we didn't have a George Bezos in our country. And you are here as a gift. You are here as a reminder that we always have to do the right thing. And you did the right thing. You contributed much more than that. I only know of one person who did that. It was Christ himself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That brings us to for me to introduce um, our principal speaker this evening, Advocate Hamotso Roka. Um, Advocate Roka was introduced to us by George Bezos, and she has been serving on our board here at the Apartheid Museum for some years. And between her and George, when it comes to legal issues, they're a formidable, formidable pair. Hamotso. Liberile. Canspera. I know a bit of Greek, George knows that. Every time you ask for an English word, George tells you about the Greek meaning and the Greek source. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, friends, it's really a great honor and a privilege for me to be standing here, to be talking. I'm not very sure about this keynote address story. I would have preferred my dear friend to just talk without this. But when I was told the, there's a title to it, I thought maybe I must look important and have, and have this. In response to an invitation to this launch by one of your friends, George, Edwin Cameron, he said, he responded by saying, I would have dearly loved to come and hear my treasured friend, Homozo Moroka, speak of a lion of our struggle. And George, indeed, you are a lion of our struggle. In your book, you pen the following. For those who let me walk with them. I believe that most of us in this room can claim that we have walked with George. Some have walked with you literally. Some, not mentioned in the books, not mentioned around here, have walked with you, the many South Africans who are eternally grateful for being you, George. They are your most appreciative companions in this walk. The museum and the books allow an exploration of the events of history from a particular perspective, a legal perspective and a human perspective, allowing us to look at these events through the eyes of someone who lived and breathed as part of our history. George, as Alistair Sparks would say in his book, has lived the different phases of the South African history. The phase, as it were, of colonization and the brutal system of apartheid, where the most systematic process, legal and otherwise, of dispossession of a people was created. The legal structures of a dis discriminatory framework, he, you lived through that oppression, but you also lived through its peaceful res resolution. But what marks you as outstanding? 
Why is it that you fought for the rights of the oppressed, the downtrodden and the marginalized? I, I've never been able in all the years of knowing George to be able to answer that question. But it may be that it was as a result of your immigration status at the beginning of your studies at WITS, as a legal representative to the SRC and your intimate association with Nelson Mandela and Oar Tambo. But suffice it to say that the upholding of the rights of others is a badge of honor. In these two books that we launched today, the first one was launched some time back, Odyssey to Freedom. We get to know George the man, George the husband. I'm afraid, I'm sorry, I apologize, I did not recognize the family. I can tell you, if you want to pay me, I will tell you all the stories that your father told about you guys, <laughs> time and again. His boys, their wives, the children and the great-grandchildren. These books, in a sense, tell us about this man. The white man, the Mlungu, the Hoa, who was unsure of his status in, our, in the country of his adoption, taking on an oppressive apartheid regime with deportation hanging over his head as a constant companion. But a man of great compassion, of a comprehensive understanding of the untenable condition of the oppressed and his willingness and commitment to fighting for their rights under circumstances that put himself and his family, those that he held dear, in jeopardy. George is known in most circles as the friend to Madiba, but he was more than a lawyer. He will regale you about the cases that he used to defend, from entering the cases, for instance, from entering the wrong, through the wrong door, to not having a dom pass, to sitting on the wrong bench, if we know, some of us knew that Piche, who was my godfather, his case went on appeal. All that he did was to refuse to sit at a desk that the magistrate had designated him to sit at, the desk that was designated for people of color. But these books also tell us about the friendship of Mandela, of Madiba, of Tata. And in the first one, the book, The Odyssey to Freedom, Mandela talks about this friendship. I quoted it, but because we've been here for too long, I'm going to jump my coat. I see all the ladies, I've seen some of them in the highest of heels. I apologize that we didn't provide you with chairs to sit. We are out of time, we are late, so I will try and be as short as possible. And say, actually, when you read your book, George, Arthur says it. He says, George has an amazing, his brain has an amazing power, the power of recollection. He says sometimes this power talks to George saying things that didn't happen. You know the story. But most of it happened. And I must tell you, when you read about these, all these cases, it's actually amazing that one human being could have done all those many cases, could have fought such a vicious and And, and, and powerful battle, powerful battle against a powerful system. It's true he didn't do it alone. We might mention your dearest friend, Arthur, Ishmael, Dala, Godfrey, Louis, Bram, and many more, George. I'm sure all those people my father was not a lawyer. <laughs> and I'll tell the story later about you and my father. But all those people were in the trenches with you. They fought while the organized profession was silent. And might, I dare say, complicit in the system. They fought and when George raised these issues with his colleagues, what they used to say to him would be, it is not their function 
to concern themselves with political matters. I must accept that things have changed, but at that time, and during that time, you had people like Dumanokwe, like Ishmael, who did not have chambers, who could not have tea with their white brethren. And I guess you would know who it is who opened his heart to them, who had tea with them, and who made their lives a little bit better. George, in his second book, takes us on a journey with his friendship with Nelson Mandela, an all-consuming friendship. He was, in a sense, the surrogate parent while Mandiba was in jail. He talks about how he looked after Zeni and Zinzi, how he managed to get them to Swaziland, how, I don't know how that happened, George, you ended up being at the Lobola Mahadi table discussing. I wish I was a fly on that wall while the negotiations were happening. But you also talk about the challenges when you had to talk to the government of the day, Kubi Kotsia on the one hand and Fandemeva, the ANC trying to convince the ANC that it is time to talk that they can still have their confidence in Madiba and that he will not betray the struggle. But I suppose the books also tell of an amazing relationship between you and Tata. And I was witness, as Dikhang has said, to that relationship. And sometimes, as it would often happen, I would have complaints about George and I'd go to Madiba and my diva would say to me, George is my brother. And I'd also go to George and complain about my diva. And George would say to me, well, you actually don't understand how this thing should pan out. But the two of them never took my side. In all these years that we had a relationship, never once. I was going to talk about, digress a bit, to talk about law as an instrument of transformation. To talk about our constitution and to talk about the preamble and to talk about where George fits in in that landscape. But I think it is late in the day. All of us, I would imagine in this room, know where we come from and where we are today. I was in an Uber coming here today and I was trying to shorten this and read it through George. And I asked this young man who was driving me, do you know George Bezos? And his answer really perturbed me. Because the young man said, well, I didn't do history at school and I was born, I, di I didn't know apartheid. And I said to him, what has that got to do with anything? Don't you think you should know your history? Don't you think you should know how we fought, how, what we did. And I said to him, please go and ask your mother and your father and go and read up. A people that doesn't know where they have been, where the sacrifices that were made, what sacrifices were made, is a doomed nation, doomed to repeat their mistakes. I will not talk about where we are. I will not talk about law and what law and justice is, because sometimes the law and justice are distant cousins who don't even talk to each other. And we knew through the apartheid era that justice and law were not on speaking terms. But at the end of it all, we had men and women. George sometimes forgets to say that there were women. Occasionally he remembers that it was men and women who fought the struggle. And lest we forget, lest we forget the sacrifices, lest we forget the marginalized, the downtrodden, lest we forget that we are not there and that Aluta continue. 
May I end really by talking about my personal relationship with George? And say, I met him 25 years ago. I mean, when I was 25, he might not remember. I had just finished at university. His friend, the one that you went to, Del to the Delmas prison trial with, the one who was the driver, the one when the police stopped you and said, Yo, I don't know whether he used the K word, but said to you, he's driving nonsense. You must talk to him. You must make sure he drives better. And just promised Dr. Motlana that he'd drive better. He talked to his driver to drive better. <laughs> he said to me, go talk to George. And George wanted me to come and join the bar. Well, there were no black people then, let alone black women. And the notion just terrified me, and then I didn't do it. But after many years, I did come to the bar. I phoned George, and I said, I'm ready. He organized that I have Karatip as my pupil master. And I thank you for all of this, George. Today, we have lots of black people, lots of black members at the bar. In fact, today, they are at an AGM the bars AGM, some of them would have loved to be here because the journey continues. The bar still has its issues. We still have our challenges and they must be there to tackle those challenges. But may I conclude by registering my own thanks for the years of friendship, the mentorship, the walks we took during the Goldstone Commission of Inquiry in the Vow, driving him around without pay. He still does it, phones me. <laughs> I need to go somewhere or some place. And I say, George, I'm not going there. And he will say with a very sad voice, oh, are you not going? And I say, no, George. I don't, think, I don't know whether you got used to my father driving you and you think I should be driving you, but I still drive George. To the years, 15 years in all that we spend at the Judicial Services Commission, sitting next to each other. And there were times when I needed to ask very awkward questions. And I always knew it would sound better coming from a white person than this black female. And I'd write him a note and say, ask this question. And without fail, George would ask the question. I thank you for that. It was challenging, it was difficult, but we managed in a small way, and we can proudly say we have an independent, transformed judiciary that is holding the line. <laughs> South Africa thanks you, George. Our country is going through a very difficult phase. I don't read the papers anymore, I don't watch TV, it's just too depressing. Di Hang in his own book, I'm My Own Liberator, talks about where we are. The inequality in our society, youth unemployment, corruption, and all those challenges. And we need to grapple with these challenges. And I believe you're still in the trenches, George, and I believe some of us who are lawyers here must continue to be in those trenches. Because if we do not, I think we're in trouble. But at the same time, we're tenacious people, we're hopeful, we are resilient, and I seriously believe that justice and equality will prevail. And that George will continue to be in the trenches. Long live. Thank you very much, Hamotso. Uh, make sure that we put your keynote address on the website so it can in its entirety be read. But thank you, very beautifully done. Now, George.
I'm about to be 90 years of age. My three <laughs> sons, their wives, my grandchildren, give me a lot of advice of what I should do and what I should not do. <laughs> For instance, they said I must be very brief. <laughs> and it reminded me of what happened many, almost 20 years ago when I was 70. The Legal Resources Center gave me a party Arthur Chaskelson was the head. And uh, when the master of ceremonies said, after the speeches were made about me, George will briefly address you. <laughs> My good friend, Arthur Chaskelson, from our student, our student days, interrupted him and said, to say that George will be brief is a contradiction in terms. <laughs> I have lived up to it. William <laughs> uh, Wilden, who helped me put the book, the last book, uh, together, and my sons, two of whom are here, one who is overseas, have told me they must be brief. And they even actually <laughs> uh, made a list of topics <laughs> of which I should be guided in what to say and not to say. As I usually do, I'll put the papers outside. <laughs> I am absolutely amazed with members of our board and the people that are working have gone to the trouble that they have in seeing what I did during my life, what members of my family, my wedding <laughs> photograph, the boat that we escaped from Nazi Germany's occupation of Greece. I want to thank and congratulate the people who have put up this historical material. And I hope that the people that come to this museum will feel a little better about what lawyers may be able to do. And I may serve as an example of some of the young people who encourage me in no end at the Legal Resources Center. I am computer illiterate. We have about 30 young people who come to me and they have a problem. I am suffering from nominal aphasia. I forget names. I don't remember what was the name of the judge that gave a wonderful judgment to be followed uh, today. And I tell the young people, well, you know, this was the issue in the maker note. They leave my office. Five minutes later, 
they come with the judgment. <laughs> Fool, here you are. Thank you very much. We will go and study it and we'll try and do the best that we can to pull people that the Legal Resources Center acts for without asking for money. And I am surprised that they got to the trouble of getting so much about my life, some of which I had forgotten. <laughs> but to sh show me swimming, <laughs> in the village in which I was born, by the sea, which my father and I had to escape together with seven New Zealand soldiers that did not uh, went to be taken prisoners by the Nazis. But my father took the initiative to get them out of occupied Greece. And I insisted of going with my father. You know why? I had passed the primary school of the village and I went to the capital of the, of the place, Kalamata, where the olives come from. And uh, I heard the teacher doing the primary work that it doesn't matter what they say about closing schools, I am going to open the school. And you, as a leader, my father had been mayor of the village, and you, you should set an example and send your son back to the primary school. And when my father said he is leaving with the seven New Zealanders, I threatened to swim behind the boat. <laughs> and if they didn't take all, me on, I was prepared to drown. <laughs> my father was quite smart. <laughs> he actually persuaded my grandfather, after whom I was not named according to tradition, but named after his son who died in the 1917 war. Uh, and he insisted that I should be named after the dead son rather than the for the, uh, the grandfather, which was the tradition. And we came to South Africa. I was not impressed, particularly with the rickshaw boys pulling loaded two-wheel things sweating, torn. There was a picture of what you saw about the Greek farmer that left Greece with New Zealand soldiers. And uh, what happened was the Sunday 
Make sure that he is wearing his best and I'm taking him to my school. And make sure that you buy him the uniform. And that actually changed my life. I must be brief. My experience, my experience showed me what was going on inside.
was going to ask Alexei to come and speak about 65 years of friendship and the other books, which are on sale here tonight at the entrance of the George Bezos Gallery. Uh, and George would be happy to sign some of these. And just uh, it, from a practical point of view, just to say we are about to come to the end of the proceedings tonight. There is food and drink out of that door, and there's food and drink out of that door. There are two areas that you can you can uh, enjoy the time left uh, with George here this evening. Thank you very much, George. Thank you very much.